Welcome to our service today. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Blessed are you, Sovereign God, Creator of all. To you be glory and praise for ever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, and in these last days you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts, your spirit ever renew our lives, and your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs, in the agony of giving birth. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was about to bear a child, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away, and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, so that there she can be nourished for one thousand two hundred and sixty days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 12. Today we're looking at the book of Revelation. And I want to look a bit deeper than the bits we usually read, the bits we generally know, which are usually the beginning and the end. We generally know that the beginning of Revelation is written, it says, by John, whilst on Patmos and that it's a circulatory letter to seven churches of Asia Minor, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Myrtia, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Revelation 1 says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you in peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, 
the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The book of Revelation then goes on. It speaks to each of the churches, saying what is good about them, or not so good, and even what is definitely not good about them. As Matthew Wilcock, in his commentary, puts it, to the churches in seven of the towns of Asia Minor, Revelation was sent as a circulatory letter, to be read aloud in their meetings as a message directed to the real needs of first century people. The churches had been established long enough to display between them the full range of spiritual conditions, from tenacious devotion to decadent laxity. The message was consequently twofold. It brought encouragements in the true apocalyptic manner to Christians who were under great pressure, assuring them that their enemies would, in the end, be destroyed and God would be triumphant. On the other hand, in the style not of apocalyptic, but of prophecy, it challenged them to combat, even within themselves, the subtle forces of evil. Christ must be given his rightful place here and now in their own spiritual and moral lives. We've heard today from Revelation chapter 12. And there's some vivid imagery, which may lead us to ask how on earth we might understand this book. When I first read Revelation many, many years ago, I found much of it very, very difficult to understand. And I'm not the only one, because there's several different understandings of the book of Revelation, and different interpretations. There are those who describe it as veiled language describing the events of John's own time. Others consider it largely a prophecy of events to come, or a mixture, a chart of history, of past events and of future, or that there are messages for the first century, prophecies of the future, and dealing with principles that are common in Christian experience. The current view is that Revelation was composed in the context of a conflict within the Christian community of Asia Minor over whether to engage with or withdraw from the far larger non-Christian community. Revelation says, uh, again a commentary, chastises those Christians who wanted to reach an accommodation with the Roman cult of empire. That's not to say that Christians in Roman Asia were not suffering for withdrawal from and defiance against the wider Roman society, which imposed very real penalties. Revelation offered a victory over this reality by offering an apocalyptic hope. And there's been much written on that subject of engagement with or without the non-Christian community, particularly written by H. Richard Niebuhr. And others. So what can we learn from Revelation? Well, it seems we live in a world where conspiracy theories abound, not just about aliens, say, though there seems to be a multitude of TV programmes devoted to the subject, but conspiracies too about our present, our past, our future. We see it too in the many debates about fake news and how we can spot it or not. Only recently I watched a docu-film about how social media and other online resources are not only collecting multitudinous data about us, but also encouraging us to use more and more social media, so that it is, for some, becoming more real than real life. And so we too face the question of our engagement with the world. How much should we live in or withdraw from? non-Christian groups or values? Does Christ occupy the rightful place in our own spiritual and moral lives, in the lives of our church, in the lives of our nation or of our world? And as we think of the letters to the churches of Asia Minor, what would our letter say? What does God think of our church, the church in our land? That gives us plenty to think about. So let's end on the notes of hope as the other well-known part of Revelation, the final chapter, Revelation chapter 22. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. 
the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let everyone who hears say, Come. And let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen.